We welcome all who seek the meaning of life and who believe that human spirituality is wider than any one tradition and deeper than any one set of opinions. With a respect for our Christian origins, we seek to explore all truths from all sources. Our fellowship gives us strength and encouragement in daily living. Welcome everyone to this, I believe, our 93rd Fellowship Sunday. I believe it is. It's our 93rd. This Sunday, it's always the Sunday that's nearest the 5th of October, as October the 5th in 1919 was the start of the long ministry at Newcastle upon Tyne Unitarians of the Reverend Herbert Barnes. He was the minister who oversaw the construction of this building, and he was the first minister here. And celebrate our links together and support for one another. This is a poem written by a member of the congregation back in 1951 for a service in February. It's entitled Our Church. O thou my church, how great thy past, what noble names thy role adorn. With love for man, and faith in truth, and mighty purpose wast thou born. And now may naught arrest thy way, may naught delay thy quickening power, may darkness not be in thy midst, but what should be thy sunrise hour? O church of mine, thou must go on, fulfil thy destiny sublime, thy prophets strengthened by the faith, that God through them redeems the time. I'd now like to read a piece that Her Herbert Barnes wrote himself about this anniversary in 1947. On Sunday, October 5th, I will begin the 29th year of my ministry in the Church of the Divine Unity. To me, at any rate, this anniversary is a great occasion. And I invite all my members and friends to do everything possible to make it memorable in the life of the church. This particular Sunday of the year has come to be known as our Fellowship Sunday. Outside the relationships of the home, there is probably no relationship more sacred than that between a minister and his people. There is a bond that inevitably grows stronger and sweeter as the years pass. There is a deepening of the friendships that one has made along the way. There is the coming and going of people in and out of one's life. The memories remain, but many personalities have gone. There is this constant coming into and going out of every church that is in the history of all churches. But our love for each other our, our respect and admiration of each other has deepened with the passing of the years. If I am spared the blessing of a serene old age, that aftermath of life in which memory plays such an important part, I am certain the bell that will ring most often in my heart will be thanksgiving for the friends that have helped me to do whatever I have been able to do. 28 years of it. The spirit in my heart as I approach my anniversary Sunday is gratitude for friends. Let the weekend of October 5th be one of glad reunion with thanksgiving for the past and courage for the future. By Herbert Barnes. Red Brocade by Naomi Shihabnai. The Arabs used to say, when a stranger appears at your door, feed him for three days before asking who he is, where he's come from, where he's headed. That way, he'll have strength enough to answer. Or, by then, you'll be such good friends, you don't care. Let's go back to that. Right? Pine nuts, 
Here, take the red brocade pillow. My child will serve water to your horse. No, I was not busy when you came. I was not preparing to be busy. That's the armor everyone put on to pretend they had a purpose in the world. I refuse to be claimed. Your plate is waiting. We will snip fresh mint into your tea. Red Book Brigade by Naomi Shihab Nye. I'm now going to read from another service from this church in December of 1954. Just to give you an idea of how people viewed Herbert Barnes and his ministry at the time. This is Herbert Barnes, an appreciation by Fran Florence Mailton. If you would seek his monument, look around you. Written of another great builder, these words might well have been spoken of Herbert Barnes. For it was his courage, vision and enterprise which inspired the building of this sanctuary to the glory of God. And nothing else mattered so much to him as the services of worship conducted here. Here, a congregation was transmuted into a fellowship and one felt the magic of the unseen presence. For this church he laboured unceasingly and with great singleness of purpose, renounced all other honours for its sake. Here indeed his memory is enshrined for as long as this church shall last. But you may find his monument in less accessible places too. Look into sick rooms and observe the tonic effect of his genial presence. Go where bereavement has come and see him bring comfort and strength to the sorrowing. Visit the old and the lonely and watch their faces brighten at his coming. Look into the primary department on a Sunday morning and see the children running to him with their treasures. Smile at his endearing, teasing ways and experience, experience always in his presence the diffusion of those good vibrations of which he once preached so cogently. He gave men a faith to live by, taught them how to keep the center stance in control of the circumstance and how to make of religion a creative and dynamic thing. There must be many who, like me, could testify to his formative influence in their lives. He was also a master craftsman in the use of words, employing them to clothe his ideas with a quality that kindled the imagination. With a flash of illumination, he could make a text glow with a new and hidden meaning, and many unforgettable sermons came crowding back into the memory now. I know my sheep, and am known of mine. This is a quote from him. Discipleship through affinity and how close that affinity was in his case. In his reverence for Jesus, he yielded to no man. For Herbert Barnes, Jesus was the way, the truth and the life. But it was the religion of Jesus and not a religion about Jesus that claimed his allegiance. Truly Christianity was never better served than by this great and good man. His prayers were the very quintessence of his religion and how one could have wished to see them preserved in a memorial volume. A fellow Unitarian minister who worshiped with us in the old church writes movingly thus, I have never known a service which was so made the moment those old baize doors opened and Herbert Barnes climbed slowly up into that Victorian pulpit. He did it. It was the hour of prayer as soon as he appeared. Had we a calendar of saints, he would already have begun the process of beatification. His influence through pulpit and press was very considerable. 
and his parish extended far beyond the confines of his own church and congregation. He was a fearless preacher and was never silent, however unpopular the cause. If under God, he felt he ought to speak. Herbert Barnes, an appreciation by Florence Railton in 1954. I thought that would give us an idea of how very much respected he was and why the fellowship service grew. He was clearly a man who was a force of nature and he was instrumental in the construction of this building. And I can't help wondering what he would think of the changes in the city around the church, around the building and what he would think of the future of the building and of the congregation. This service, as I said before, grew as a way for the congregation to be thankful for the ministry of Herbert Barnes, but it grew into a way to celebrate the friendship between congregation members. It became a way for new members to be welcomed in, but it is also a way to acknowledge any members who have passed away in the previous 12 months. We have a Robinson book of memorials recording those names and I'd now I'd like to invite Louise to come up and read from the book. Thank you Louise. Hello everyone. Uh, as you will notice, I'm not actually carrying the Robinson book with me. It is a great volume of some substantiveness. Uh, I shall be happy to get both that and the book of records out later so that we may look at them. Uh, as Nana has said, uh, the Robinson book is where we enter memorial notices for members of our congregation uh, who have uh, passed away. Um, I have several, I have two to add and a correction to our role of honour, which is the names of those who died in service during the World Wars. Our first notice uh, is for Helen McCullough, who was born in the, on the 23rd of May 1930 and passed away on the 17th of July uh, 2022. Despite having a long journey to get here, Helen attended regularly and her good nature and intelligence were a great asset to our congregation. Many members remember her cheerfulness and her great insight into our services and into Unitarian beliefs. I knew Helen, I may, I think, be one of the few people present here who did. Uh, she was a very perceptive person and also very cheerful. Uh, she was a great Unitarian and it was a pleasure to have known her. Um, my other notice is from Roy Hislop. Uh, he passed away in September 2021. I should perhaps add that we would normally have added his notice since then, but uh, given everything that's happened over the past couple of years, uh, we're just getting in touch with the calligrapher to have it added. So this was actually written by Morris, who knew Roy. Uh, he was born on the 7th of June 1944 and died on the 27th of September 2021. Roy Hislop was a member of Newcastle on Tyne Unitarians since his Sunday school days. He later became a member of the Unitarian Young People's League. He was a great friend to Maurice Large, acting secretary of the congregation for many years. Uh, the two were each other's best men at their respective weddings. Uh, Roy Hislop often uh, assisted with behind the scenes work for the Durant Players, the theatre company that would perform uh, in the stage in the Durant Hall. Uh, and it, it might was put under the guidance of Ron Paulson. Uh, Ron was another mainstay uh, of our congregation and one of those people every congregation has uh, who appears to be a great guiding force throughout it. Uh, in the early 1970s, Roy Hislop's work took him to Surrey, where he remained. He and Morris stayed friends, uh, culminating in a trip to Ireland, in which Morris mentioned something along the lines of, we nearly got arrested due to a case of mistaken identity, thinking people, causing people to think we hadn't been involved in a train robbery. There's clearly a story there, and I hope at some point to sit Morris down uh, and ask him how on earth that misunderstanding occurred. That is the memorial for Roy Hislop, and Morris ended it with uh, rest in peace, my friend. Uh, 
And I should also add uh, a correction uh, for the uh, role of honour. Um, I'll just we'll, we'll touch on this more in the remembrance uh, Sunday service. But uh, Susan Huston Dalvleish uh, is the daughter of Norman Huston, who is listed in the role of honour. Uh, and it, she has said uh, that he was that we need to amend his record to say that he was a Far East prisoner of war in Japan, and we will be doing so. Uh, I'm happy to report that I have looked up his entry on the FIPAL, Far East Prisoners of War Roll of Honour. Uh, he returned safely home from Japan, uh, got married upstairs uh, when he returned, had two children, and he and his family remained members of the congregation. So I will be seeing to it that the Roll of Honour is corrected. Those are, are the additions to the Robinson book for this year uh, and the correction to the role of honour. This is a poem called If I Should Go by Grace Wanker. If I should die before the rest of you, break not a flower nor inscribe a stone. Nor when I'm gone, speak in Sunday voice. Be the usual selves that I have known. Weep if you must, parting is hell. But life goes on, so sin as well. If I should go, I just my hand. What I'd now like to share, talking about Herbert Farms again, you'll be sick of them by the end. This is an address. Um, I'm afraid I don't know the year, um, but this was, this is entitled Living in a World of People. As I look at the kind of human world in which we live, I see this very clearly, that the abatement of our human dissensions is one of our major problems. The failure of people to get along with others produces estrangements between friends and rifts in family life. In the larger areas of human relations, it leads to social conflicts and in international wars. Somebody has said that the kingdom of God is the kingdom of right relations. It is a wise saying. It may well be that the New Testament admonition to live at peace with all men is a counsel of perfection. Men with free minds and big convictions do not find it easy. Even the truly great have not always found it possible. Socrates had his trouble with the city authorities. Jesus had his frictions with the Pharisees. Paul had his and Lincoln had his. Could we not, however, adopt the following as a practicable goal? The establishment of the widest possible harmonious relationships consistent with self-respect and decent regard for sincerity. Such a goal demands both a philosophy and a technique. Getting along with other people is both an art and a science. Here is one evident fact of life which we have to learn to handle, censoriousness, which tends to create friction between one person and another. Criticism is a necessity in the individual and social order. Spare criticism and you spoil progress. Because there are critics of things as they are, we come nearer to things as they should be. Either a sage individual or a wise society can well take to heart the counsel of George Bernard Shaw. Embrace your reproaches, for they are often angels in disguise. It is when criticism becomes censorious that friction enters in. It was not criticism, but censoriousness that Jesus had in mind when he told us to judge not, that we be not judged. The censorious person is the person in whom criticism has become a fixed habit. If only we could break the grip of that one habit, it would aid us much in getting along with people. 
towards the breaking of the grip of this bad habit, I would suggest this. When we are tempted to be hypercritical, we might ask ourselves a few penetrating questions. Is my criticism just? Do I know all the facts? Am I repeating hearsay? Will my criticism accomplish good? Or am I only rejoicing in evil? Those questions would often give us pause. I would suggest a second thing. In this world of personal relationships, it is well to avoid an excessive seriousness. Humour is a help, especially that form of it that enables us to occasionally laugh at ourselves. If we want to get on amicably with other people, we have to learn at times to laugh with people. Seriousness should well be in the background of our lives. It should rarely be kept in the foreground. Let religion and light be leavened by a little good humour. There is a twinkle in the eyes that is a help. There is a third thing, and the most necessary thing. In this world of other people, we have to respect the personalities of other people. This is important in every possible human relationship, from homes to nations. Disrespect of one nation for others causes war. If that feeling of respect for the rights and personalities of other nations can be made to grow more and more, the possibilities of wars will become less and less. I would urge a further bit of counsel on men and women living in a human world. Avoid supersensitiveness as you would avoid the plague. Be it noted that I have said supersensitiveness. The difference between a statue and a living man is a matter of sensitiveness. A reasonable sensitiveness to the moods and thoughts of others is necessary if we are to avoid censoriousness, over seriousness, and disrespect of the personality of others. It is when sensitiveness becomes super sensitiveness that we imperil our friendships and happy relationships. Super sensitiveness is a virtue that has become a vice. It is a perverted good. Everett Hale once gave very good advice to a young minister. It was to this effect. In this world of other people, learn to be thick but not hard. That is good advice to all of us. In this world of people, the other people are very like ourselves. Herbert Barnes' advice on friendships and living with other people. This has been a service about fellowship and thankfulness for being together, for friendships, for community, for a group brought together in spirituality and love. I'm going to extinguish our chalice with part of a poem called On Friendship by Khalil Gibran. And a youth said, speak to us of friendship. And he answered saying, your friend is your needs answered. He is your field which you sow with love and reap with thanksgiving. And he is your board and your fireside. For you come to him with your hunger and you seek him for peace. When your friend speaks his mind, you fear not the nay in your own mind nor do you withhold the eye. And when he is silent, your heart ceases not to listen to his heart. For without words, in friendship, all thoughts, all desires, all expectations are born and shared with joy that is unacclaimed. When you part from your friend, you grieve not. For that which you love most in him may be clear clearer in his absence, as the mountain to the climber is clearer from the plain. And let there be no purpose in friendship, save the deepening of the spirit. So good.